We bout to party. Unrestricted. Got the house now. We gon' turn it up. Up. Bring the house down. Got that big space pump and make them bounce now. Flossing like they bossing and the freaks are coming out now. AEW Unrestricted. I am Aubrey Edwards. He is Will Washington. Welcome to our podcast where we talk about all kinds of fun stuff happening in the camera, in front of the camera, behind the camera, all these things at AEW. Uh, We've got lots of fun stuff to talk about, but one of the things that's obviously exciting is that we are getting closer and closer to All In. I think next week we're doing our first show in Wales, which is absolutely crazy. I know. It's insane to think about the fact that Dynamite has never left North America. You know, the All In was was such a blast last year. And the only thing I remember thinking as we left was, I wish we could have done this longer. I wish we could have been here longer. I wish there was more time. Mm-hmm. And I wish there was more of an opportunity for the fans to get to see us. And guess what? They have that opportunity hey. to do the show in Cardiff, to do Dynamite and Collision. And Cardiff is going to be really cool. Um, if you haven't had a chance to get those tickets and you're in that area, awtix.com is the place to get those tickets. I'm really excited for it. I'm really excited because I, th- I think the big thing that we we got from like Wembley last year, at least I got, is just the crowd feels so completely different yes. when we're on the other side of the Atlantic, right? Like, first, it's insane to realize that AEW has as big of a presence as it does outside of the US. And I know that we're available in like 130 plus countries, but to hear that number and then to like feel it in the moment where you have all these people like chanting football style chants at you <laughs> when you're in the ring doing all this stuff in a stadium, it's it's wild, right? It kind of got me thinking about just sort of the fans and the fan experience and maybe like, you know, fans as a character. So I thought that kind of led real nicely into uh, our podcast today. So who's our guest, Will? Well, today, Aubrey, we're joined by somebody that I'm quite familiar with, uh, that I get to work with on a regular basis. I've shared many a car ride and a couple of churros with. Uh, She is the one and only Jennifer Pepperman. What is the official title? Is that a VP of Content Development for AEW? Yes. Jen, thanks for being here. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. Okay, we got to run through uh, the the background a little bit. So you're a three-time Daytime Emmy Award winner. Yes. Which is insane. I remember reading the press release when you got hired. And one, I was excited because I was like, oh my God, we have a woman in the room. That's awesome. (laughs) Like from a representation standpoint, our roster was already like, had a rocket strapped to it. And I was like, this is going to be so great for us. This is amazing. And it was like, three time Emmy Award winner. Oh my God, she's legit. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm, I'm curious, like coming out of the gate, what's the difference between writing, because your background's in, uh, or a lot of your awards were all won in soap operas. Like, what's the big difference jumping from soap operas to wrestling? My awards actually in soap operas, which uh, sometimes people don't actually know this. They're actually for directing, not for writing. Right. So I didn't know, when I first started in, in wrestling at WWE, I didn't know anything about wrestling. I mean, I knew what it was. I hadn't, you know, been a fan. I didn't have a background. So I kind of really just got to be like a sponge and learn everything I could from like a lot of very different talented people. And I realized, I realized that professional wrestling is like this magical, beautiful art form. And one of the things that, that I was really taken by was that the audience is actually like a character. So after I'd been working for a couple of months, like I had this sort of aha moment and I was like, you know, dramatically, it's not that different than a soap opera, except In professional wrestling, you have a good guy and a bad guy in dramatic conflict, but that conflict is solved by fighting in a wrestling ring. Whereas in a narrative drama, it's, you know, solved by, you know, someone gets shot, someone gets stabbed, people fall in love, people get divorced, someone's cheating on someone, like, you know. All of that happens in wrestling too, by the way. (laughs) It does. Hopefully not the shooting, but it does. Yes. The conflict is solved, you know, by fighting in a ring, so... There's a ton of similarities between soap operas and wrestling. Oh, I love that. Well, as as we'll circle back to that in a little bit, I want to talk about uh, you coming to AEW. How did that conversation initially start? It initially started with a conversation with Mercedes. I was um, I worked very closely with her at WWE, and so it sort of you know started as a conversation of like you know that she has this really great opportunity to come to this really great company and. Would I have any interest in, you know, coming along with her? First, I have to say, like, I adore Mercedes. 
uh, not only as a person, but as a talent. She's the best. She's one of those people. She's just really, really special. She's someone who has been a pioneer in this industry. People talk about like breaking down barriers and shattering glass ceilings. Well, that's exactly what Mercedes has done. Mm -hmm. She's so inspiring to me. I think Mercedes doesn't even actually know how talented she is. And we just really connect it, you know, creatively. Um, I love the creative process. What I love most about the creative process is that it's collaborative. I believe the creative process is best when it's collaborative. And Mercedes is a is a really great collaborator. We work really well together. And I just believe in her so much. You know, the WWE was a really great place for me. I worked with a lot of really great people there. I have a lot of friends there. I, I wish them well. But for me, Mercedes and I, our working relationship was really unique and really special. And so it was a chance to continue that journey wherever it might take us. So I have to say one other thing, though, about coming to AEW. So that yeah, was like sure. the first step. And when I met with Tony, I immediately wanted to come work here. <laughs> He's the best. <laughs> From his creativity, his passion, his joy, his love for professional wrestling. I mean, his mind. As So Mercedes was the first step. And as soon as I met Tony, I was like, I need to be here. It's one of the things that I love about wrestling, the more, the longer I've been in it, is realizing it works the same way as a lot of other industries. Like when you find those people that you really enjoy working with, you tend to follow them and go to the other companies because you've had such a great experience and kind of just changing the setting allows you guys to be the same people, but learn and share in new experiences. And it's just really awesome. And seeing the two of you work together has been really rewarding from my, my perspective. I'm curious, what other talent have you been working with uh, or finding that you've been working with? I usually always work with uh, Dustin Rhodes. Dustin and I actually, you know, know each know each other on the other side. So I've worked with Dustin a lot. Um, I really like working with Undisputed Kingdom oh, on best. sort of our Ring of Honor si side. I work a lot with um, Athena and Billy. I've worked with Brian Danielson, of course. Uh, I kind of just you know, whatever's going on in the show and, you know, whoever I can work with, I would love to work with. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that was really cool and really the place that I think you and I really got to, to work together the most was uh, starting out at Mercedes's first real feud in AEW. It was the, the Willow and Mercedes feud and getting to put those promos together. I remember the contract signing was just a blast to put together. Yeah, that was really, <laughs> we had a lot of fun. I mean, that was really, I mean, I didn't know Willow and that was a really great, I mean, Will was so great in that. Will, your Will is so super talented. He never takes enough credit for how talented he is. He so doesn't. To put that out there right now, but it was it was really great getting to know Willow and working that whole story. I mean, that's sort of I think been really my favorite story since uh, since I've been here. Yeah, and I say that because like I was literally just 24 hours ago rewatching the contract signing and just thinking about how that came together. And literally, when Mercedes was up in the air and the crowd coming to their feet and they were just waiting for that moment with the table, everything was just chef's kiss. It was so much fun, and I think that was I knew in that moment I was like, this is going to be a great working relationship. And mm -hmm. and honestly, one of the things I love when somebody comes into AEW because I I, I talk about this a lot on this show about how AEW is very much a cornucopia of professional wrestling. When you think about people that have so many backgrounds, you have people who've got backgrounds in Ring of Honor, people who've had backgrounds in TNA, people who've had backgrounds in WWE, people whose first experience in wrestling is in AEW, whatever it is, but people have so many backgrounds that come from so many different walks of professional wrestling. And that was the thing I loved watching you come into the company was that when you came in, so many eyes lit up and so many people walked in and were like, oh my God, Jen's here. And then I remember Ric Flair walks in the room and he's like, that he turns to Tony and he goes, Tony, you got yourself a real one right here. Yeah, and <laughs> <I'm> Rick. <laughs> and so what was so great was recognizing right off the bat how much of an impact you had made on so many people throughout your years in professional wrestling and knowing oh, that you had come into professional wrestling with no real prior knowledge of it is, is such a cool thing to me. You did have a lot of reuniting here coming to AEW, no? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, let's see, now I'm gonna, so I had like Roddy, I had worked with Roddy uh, before and I had worked with Mike De Bennett. I ha hadn't worked with Taven, um, but like I had worked with Tony Storm at WWE and Claudio and a little bit John Moxley, but Claudio a lot, Brian a lot. Um, I had, of course, I knew Swerve. I don't think we really worked together a lot, but we definitely knew each other. 
like Dustin is another one. So um, I remember when Ruby walked in, she was really excited to see you. Oh yes, Ruby, yes, yes. Oh my God, yes, Ruby and Soraya. I forgot. I forgot Ruby because she hasn't been. Uh, she's been out for a little. She's bit. been a little busy. Yeah. <laughs> she's been a little busy. <laughs> and Soraya. And when Rick was there, so when Rick was with us, so I had I had worked with Rick in in um, some backstages and stuff at WWE with Charlotte. It was great. It was a great feeling to see some, you know, familiar faces. And I also was just say, just like in life, it's really exciting if you can get to learn something new. Always learning something new is really exciting. That is a great note. And I want to touch on more of that when we come back from a quick break here on AEW Unrestricted. AEW Unrestricted, Aubrey, Will, Jen, we're having a great conversation, a little more backstage than we normally get, uh, seeing as Jen is our <laughs> Vice President of Content Development and helps us uh, with a lot of the content that you end up seeing on AEW television. So you had mentioned sort of learning new things and being in a setting where you can learn new things. I'm I'm curious, what have you learned at AEW in your time with us that maybe you is is different than what you had picked up at WWE? So one of the things that I was really, um, so the, the structuring of the show is, is very different than how, you know, we would structure a show on WWE. And uh, I've been fascinated by that. And the amount of storytelling within a match and the amount of like sort of pay-per-view matches we have on AEW is still t continues to amaze me. I'm also struck by the, there's a freeness that really sparks creativity here. So I mm. think that's been a really cool thing. And also I feel at AEW, like everyone really gets to feel heard creatively. And I think that's also really, really important. And so that was sort of some of sort of the, how the structure is different, a more freeing process, if that makes sense. I, I, I kind of love that uh, observation about the storytelling within matches, because that is something that we really do focus on a lot as a company in, in making sure that our audience is connecting with what's happening in the ring in terms of the story we're telling. You know, another thing that you, not, you and I have talked about is is the fans, that there's definitely a, a, a astuteness to the fans and where they really pay attention to what's happening in the show and really pick up on certain things. And I feel like that's something that, you know, you kind of have to grapple with in terms of making the story happen. Have you found differences in how fans react to the things that you've had to put together in segments? You know, in in all honesty, like I'm not I'm not a big uh, social media like following person. I, ne I never was at, at WWE. Stay and, that way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, it's for the best. It's for the best, honestly. <laughs> I kind of like to just feel the fan reaction in the in the moment, you know, in the arena. And it's also always great to watch as a fan, too. I mean, I don't know. I mean, when there's a segment going on, especially a segment that I'm involved in, like, I just want my talent, whoever they may be, to, like, just do the best they can. So I kind of feel like in a way, like, that I'm, like, you know how, like, a, a parent, like, is so excited, you know, for their kids to do well. Like, I just, I just want whatever, whatever segment I'm working in or involved in, like, I just want it like for them, for the talent to just go, go and be the best it can be. So sometimes I'm just, I'm just pulling for them so much in the segment, but you know, I find the audience is definitely very responsive and usually, usually they pop where you want them to pop and they boo where they want you to boo. But definitely um, I've gotten to experience some really electric crowds. So that's always fun. The live experience is really what makes wrestling. So independent of Twitter discourse, social media discourse, what have you, it's like if we're experiencing it in the moment and it's special, then I feel like everyone's happy. Us, people in the ring, people in the crowd, like it's incredible. So I know Will probably knows the answer to this question because you guys work together so closely, but I actually have no idea. What does a show day look like for you? A show day is a little bit different on a dynamite day when Mercedes is there than maybe a collision collision day. They're kind of on a dynamite day. You know, I've pretty much, you know, discussed uh, whatever segments Mercedes and I are working on. And uh, I actually do, you know, sort of write out a segment for her so she can, you know, see it. And I always find like with talent, especially if they have a match, um, if they're going to cut a promo, it's easier for you to write some words down for them. And it's easier to like, look at that and be like, okay, well, I want to say this. I don't want to say that. I want to say this rather than just them starting from scratch. I mean, that's just kind of like how I'm used to working. So Mercedes and I would have probably like emailed back or texted back, you know, a segment. And then 
if there's something that needs, needs to be rehearsed, you know, we'll rehearse it. But then it's basically just, you know, rehearsing the promo with her and, you know, making, making sure she feels really good about it. Then if there's any other pre-tapes, you know, that I, I can jump in on and help on, you know, just sort of like lend a hand wherever I can sort of lend a hand. I agree with that, that, you know, on a dynamite day, you know, when you talk about, you know, obviously it's, you, you work so closely with Mercedes, but, you know, watching you on Saturdays at Collision, you know, that's, those are the days that you, I notice you kind of get to know more of the talent that you haven't gotten to work with. And then, you know, there's producing pre-tapes. You've done pre-tapes with uh, Top Flight, with uh, with Shane Taylor Promotions, those guys. Oh, I love Shane Taylor Promotions. <laughs> oh, my God, the best. Guys. Yeah, they're the best. They're so great. And uh, just watching you get to work with those talents who have really wanted to pick your brain and get a feel for how you put together a segment. W would you agree that Saturdays have given you more of an opportunity to get to know a lot more of the roster? Yes. So on Saturdays on Collision, um, I love basically being in the pre-tape room like all day. Oh, actually, one thing that was really pretty cool. So I got to work a couple times with uh, Dustin and the Von Erics. So, so that was really, really fun. Mm -hmm. Dustin was one of the people at WWE who was super, super nice to me when I first came. So you never forget when you're new and someone's <laughs> someone's nice to you. It's, it's so, the absolute same, by the way, that uh, I was intimidated because this is a TV does not do the size of Dustin Rhodes justice. And like, no, I agree that huge. the first time I walked in... Um, he asked me about my background and he was the first person to do so. And I told him about the, the background I had in television, things like that. And then from then on, uh, he's been the kindest person in the world to me. And he's helped me. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't know that Dustin has produced a lot of the, the creative that I've worked on um, in terms of in ring. It's been so cool working with him. But the fact that it, so I can see that experience for you even six, seven years ago in WWE, because I had that experience a year and a half ago with Dustin. And Dustin's one of my favorite people in professional wrestling. So and uh, he's so yeah. good. He's so kind. Uh, love Dustin. So I recently I recently got to work with the Bang Bang Gang. Uh, oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> I love the Bang Bang Gang. Oh, my God. Who doesn't? So, so, so fun. So I love to hang out in the pre-tapes room on collision days and you know work with whoever has a pre-tape and who's ever ready. Because it's really exciting to from all my directing stuff, like I like to sort of just like sit back and watch and see what, you know, someone wants to say and just see how I can help and make it better. So I love doing pre-tapes. They're totally super fun. And I love, you know, trying to, everyone's trying to figure out what exactly they want to say. And uh, it's super fun. So, uh, and as well as Ring of Honor for Ring of Honor and some of the Ring of Honor tapings that we did. And I will say, I love working with Athena on Ring of Honor. We worked together in WWE. And her whole sort of character and with Billy and with Lexi is, is really just such so fun to work on. It's so great. I love that you have two different experiences during the week, the dynamite and the collision, because the shows do have like a different vibe. So the fact that you get to kind of play a different role in each of those shows is really fascinating. As we mentioned before, your Emmys are in directing and getting a little bit kind of more sitting outside and seeing what the pre-tapes kind of turn out to be. Do you see yourself doing any more directing in the future? Or are you kind of more like, I like where I'm at right now? <laughs> I do. I mean, uh, it was 2022. I shot a little show that's going to be out soon on Amazon Prime called After Forever. It's a short form series. It's the last and final season. I actually... Uh, WWE, I took all my vacation to be able to shoot that in one block. So that's coming out. Um, that's all shot on location in New York City, and it's all shot single camera style. And I'm actually Whoa. very proud of that because there's some really actually beautiful sort of stuff in that. Um, that's won some film festivals. So that's sort of getting up and, r and running. I have a little short film that I want to make. Maybe I'll make it when I have one or two days to shoot it. It's only like uh, 10 minutes long. So, yeah, I mean, directing is a real love. It's a real passion of mine. I'm actually really pretty good at it. Clearly. So like, I would never really, you know, close the door, but, you know, one day at a time. And right now I'm extremely happy, not only happy, but I feel extremely lucky and fortunate to be at AEW, to work with so many great people. And I will just say one of my favorite things about AEW is I feel that everyone at AEW is so passionate about their jobs and what they do and that there is a genuine joy and love for wrestling and i think that's really amazing well one of the things uh i wanted to kind of ask you about let, let, let's take it all the way back actually we learned about how you got into professional wrestling uh but what led you on the road to soap operas 
<laughs> okay, so I was a huge soap fan growing up, huge soap fan. And I started watching soaps the way most people start watching soaps. In soaps, they call it uh, grandmothered in, where you either watch with a grandparent. <laughs> That's what they call it. They call it grandmothered in. You either watch with a grandparent or your mom. So when I was a little kid and I'd be playing outside with my brother, she would make us come inside and have lunch as she watched her story. And her story, she was she was days of our lives. She was very much an NBC sort of person. So I was a soap opera fan. And then also sort of coincidentally, a long time ago, my uncle was a soap cameraman. He started as a cameraman on Sesame Street and he did Sesame Street and like the Dick Frost show and the Merv Griffin show. He worked on the edge of night and he eventually became a director, but then he left soaps and he died kind of early of a heart attack. So a love of soaps from that. Actually, it kind of relates in a way to my uncle, but he he was dead at the time, unfortunately. But uh, so I was doing extra work in New York City. So I, I went to Syracuse University. I believe it or not, have a BFA in acting, except now I very much do not like to be in front of the camera, only behind the camera. <laughs> you know, as things, things change. And I was doing extra work on Guiding Light. I sent in my little headshot and resume and I got extra work on Guiding Light. And I'm waiting for my set to come up and this woman they say um you need to go to the control room right now and i'm like oh dear gosh what did i i just, like didn't even eat, eat any of the catering why do i have to come like i have to go to the control room <laughs> and this woman was like jennifer peppermint are you related to dick peppermint and i said yes that was my uncle and she was like oh she was like i'm kathy marr she's like i used to date your uncle like way way back and i had i had no i had no idea so she was like, do you want to come sit in the control room? And so I came and I sat in the control room and I had never been in the control room and seen, you know, soaps as multi, you know, I had never, and back on Guiding Light, sound effects and music were live to the floor. So like when you were in the control room and a phone rang, you know, a phone actually rang. I mean, it was, cause it was a, a long time ago. And uh, then I did my diner set and uh, I went home and I said to, George, who I was dating, who ended up being my husband, I said, you know, I saw the production side, like it was really, really cool. Like I really liked that. You wouldn't believe how cool it was. And he said to me, well, why don't you call Kathy and ask her if you could temp? And uh, so I did. So I started temping and then I got hired and then I was Xeroxing scripts and answering phones and when, back when there was no voicemail. And uh, again, I was in a situation where I was just, you know, kind of really hungry to learn. and. Uh, I did a lot of different jobs on Guiding Light, and then I went from Guiding Light to One Life to Live in a promotion. Then an executive producer came to One Life to Live, who I had worked with on Guiding Light and promoted me even more. And then I got pregnant, and then I went to another show. I did a lot of different, I was a producer, I was a director, I was, I was even an executive producer. So I kind of, I went from Guiding Light, One Life to Live, as the world turns, then back to One Life to Live. Wow. Uh, and then they were all canceled out of New York City. You know, I had a, I have a family, so I really couldn't uproot my family to California. So I was like, you know, what am I, what am, what am I going to do? What, what do I know how to do aside, aside from work on a soap opera? So I produced a short film, which did play in some festivals. It was called Jack and Diane. And uh, then I saw a job listing on LinkedIn for WWE and I applied and they told me they're never going to hire you because you don't know anything about wrestling. And, and Jokes uh, on them. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. And there's so much more I, I want to get into with Jen Pepperman. And we're going to have so much more of that right here when AEW Unrestricted continues. AEW Unrestricted, Will Washington, it's Aubrey Edwards, and we have our guest, Jen Pepperman, here. Jen Pepperman, of course, is VP of Content Development for All Elite Wrestling. We were just talking about your experience in TV and how it brought you to uh, WWE, but I, I really want to get into that experience with TV because there are a lot of years you just talked about there and kind of put into to a couple of sentences, but really, that's a big experience there. What's one story working in soap operas that most people probably wouldn't believe? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> working in a soap opera, it got much more challenging uh, as the years went by because the, the budgets, you know, sort of shrunk. But working on a soap opera is kind of like 
producing a play from the first read reading through all the way through to like opening night. So in a soap opera, when you're the soap opera day begins at a, at 7 a.m. with a rehearsal with a director and AD and a PA in what we call dry rehearsal, just in a room. It's the actors and those people and you sort of, you know, you read through their scenes, but you also give them their blocking and they kind of like block it out and work it out and they put a hair and makeup. And then, you know, you go to the floor and you're shooting it. So it's kind of like, I think a lot of people would not know how quickly soap operas go and how much sort of material they do. And one, I don't know, one story just, um, just, <laughs> just popped into my, into my head on uh, as the world turns. And I even, I forget whose wedding it was, but someone hijacked the wedding and he had the bride at knife point And then like someone shot him so that he dropped the knife. But of course it was a rubber knife. And then the edit, we noticed that when he dropped it, it bounced <laughs> like a couple of feet. <laughs> so that was, uh, I think the thing people wouldn't believe about soap operas is uh, a lot of the characters there that have longevity, the, actors and actresses have been playing them for so long that they really know the, the characters better than anyone. Mm. There's also sort of a soap opera thing I used to tell young actors, like kind of like Field of Dreams. Um, a young actor, if you play it, they will write it. Because soap operas are on every day, like if you want to work with someone or maybe you want to be in a love story with someone, if you act like you have chemistry, then Usually the writers will be like, oh, these two should definitely be together. Look at all that chemistry they have. So like if you play it, they will write it. <laughs> Love that line. I'm kind of curious because you were at WWE from 2017 to this year and then you joined AEW. Talking about it from sort of the fan perspective, like wrestling changes so quickly. And at the same time, there's a lot of things that sort of stand the test of time, sort of things that never change. I'm curious, is there anything that has really changed how you approach creating segments for wrestling over the course of time, whether it's like the way that TV has changed, the way that fans have changed. What's sort of been like the catalyst for change over the course of all these years? I will definitely say over the, over the last year, I think it's really important to listen to the audience and listen to the fan reaction. I mean, obviously our fans are like our, you know, third character in the scene, but I think some somehow real recently, I think it's really important to listen to the fans and really engage the fans. And I think when you are a wrestling fan, there's so much fun in trying to figure out what's going to happen. Like, oh, I know where they're going. They're going this way. And then there's an excitement of like, yes, I was right. That's what they're doing. And then there's an excitement of when you totally pivot and be like, oh, that's not what, oh, I thought they were going in a different direction. I feel like really listening to the fan engagement and really listening to the fan. I feel like, you know, AEW does that. I feel like WWE really did that on the lead up to Mania, you know, where there was sort of a big 180. And I think over time, you know, as everything evolves and changes, you know, our audiences are smarter and, you know, obviously people consume entertainment differently now, even than they did 10 years ago. You know, and I think storytelling is a little bit, is a little bit different. You know, I just think, you know, as things change, and this goes for the narrative world too, you know, dramas need to change with the times, you know? So it's very, very interesting to me because whether you work in professional wrestling or you work in a narrative drama or you're, or I should say, whether you're a fan of soaps or wrestling or sports, everything is very subjective. Mm -hmm. In soaps, our audience was always very vocal about, you should do this or you should do this. And, and same thing in, in wrestling, the audience is very vo vocal, which I think we all love, but even in sp professional sports, it's like, can you believe, you know, the fourth quarter time was running out and they ran the ball. They should have thrown the ball. Fan wise, everything is very subjective. I think it's very important to be in touch with what people like and what they don't like. One period of your career that uh, I think it's a place where I think both AEW and WWE really found some new footing and got to thrive. And I'm talking about the pandemic mm. and specifically a time period where I think both companies really had to find new ways to storytell in a way where you don't necessarily have that audience anymore. And you have to engage the viewer at home without necessarily having the tool of having the, the fans in the arena and sort of that unpredictable element. 
you know, you worked very closely with Mercedes in that time period. You also worked very closely with Bailey in that time period. And that's really where Bailey um, became who I think a lot of people didn't expect her to. There was one role that people kind of knew she was for a very long time. And then all of a sudden, here she is in this new role. And then the pandemic really allowed her to grow. Um, and, and like I said, in kind of the same way that the pandemic introduced AEW fans to guys like Ricky Starks, um, got to see Sting uh, come in. And, and so much happened during that pandemic time period uh, that really grew the product. Um, so for you, I wanted to ask you, how much of your television background did you feel helped guide you in that era of not having the fans anymore? I, I mean, the pandemic era looking looking back now was was really it was really a very very special time and bailey and sasha i will say for wwe really were like the mvps of the (laughs) of the pandemic they really did they had all the gold they really did carry raw you know and smackdown due to you know a, a lot of people you know not you know a lot of other people being out and not you know, not us not having people, but in terms of like getting to do the cinematic matches and and stuff. So at AEW, we have no invisible camera and I definitely get that. And that's a different, you know, that's something that I'm, you know, that I've had to learn and, and, and adjust to, but at WWE, you know, you could, when you do have the invisible camera, it allows you to do some sort of very subtle things. And, you know, the camera can really help you tell story in a, in a very different way. Like one kind of little tiny thing that we, I don't know if people noticed, but you know, we were leading up to Bailey turning on Sasha and everyone thought it was going to be Sasha turning on Bailey. And anytime we, you know, did a backstage pre-tape and this was, you know, before Mercedes had, you know, won a title and stuff, I always would have her holding Bailey's title, like holding it and looking at it. And then like maybe a little bit too long and giving to her, but you know, you could do something like start tight on a, title, see someone's hands, pick it up, come to their face, you know, and then widen out, Bailey's warming up and, you know, oh, here's, you know, here's your title, like just sort of little sort of nuance, things like that. Like, I mean, one of the things I love about being a director is, you know, you learn how to visually tell story Mm -hmm. when you do have freedom and to do things very differently. I remember we did, um, God, we did a backstage with Dolph and and Sonia, you know, right after, you know, the big uh, Mandy and Otis, you know, WrestleMania thing. And, and just the way we shot that with her in the foreground and him behind her, you know, talking to her was very much like a, a two shot and tightening in. And so, and we were limited because we were in this tiny warehouse. So being able to have a lot of freedom with the, the camera, even in, you know, a minute 30 shot, it's a lot of fun to me. Cause like I said, you know, it's, it's fun and just doing very subtle things in camera movement can really help tell a story. So that was really a lot of fun for me. Hearing you describe that, it becomes very clear your directorial background because you're explaining telling the story purely just with camera shots. And it's like, oh, of course she has this incredible background and it's definitely influencing a lot of like the way that you create all these segments and stuff. And it's just absolutely fascinating. When we did, uh, when we would do, and even like a 15 second shot, like camera movement can really help. So when I was working with Rhonda, like Rhonda's a legit really fighter and she's really good at striking, you know? So I would be like to the guys, can we, you know, can we start on this empty frame and let her punches in and then widen out and we see it's her widening out? Or can we start on the shadow of her doing it on the wall and then come to her, you know? And even though it's only like a, you know, 15 second shot, it's, to me, it's very fun and very creative, but I understand, you know, I understand why, you know, there's definitely different schools of thought, thought and there's no right way to do something. I mean, like I said earlier about everything's just subjective, like my opinion is only my opinion. Exactly. But even then, 15 seconds can do a lot when you only have, say, 90 seconds in a pre-tape. That's, yeah. that's insane. So setting a scene is uh, completely, wow, yeah. I'm kind of curious, as we, as we wrap up here, what would you say is like the biggest piece of advice you would want to give to someone who is interested in writing for wrestling? I guess I would say, um, I mean, this is just the way that I approach it because it's kind of the only way that it's just how my mind works. Um, I would say work backwards. I would say when you're trying to write a story, think of the end of the story and then go back to the beginning and figure out how you're going to get there. But I would say think about the dramatic conflict. Think about 
what the good guy wants and what the bad guy wants. Think about why these two characters are fighting. And then overall, I would say to anyone who's getting into any career, you don't have to be the smartest, you don't have to be the most talented, but you can be the hardest worker. And it matters if you try hard and it matters if you work hard and it matters if you don't give up. So if this is your dream to work in wrestling, write your own wrestling show, post it on Twitter, keep trying, keep trying. And the other thing is like, don't let anyone tell you no. And like I said, like, just try hard, just keep trying. You know, it's kind of like uh, in Finding Nemo, like- uh, <laughs> Just keep swimming. Just yeah, swimming, just keep-, just keep swimming. If I would ever get like down or insecure and like, I don't know what I'm doing. My God, I don't know, is this any good? I wrote this, God, maybe this sucks. Uh, like, what am I doing? And I would just be like, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. <laughs> it, matter, it, it, just, it really matters. Like everyone thinks it's like, I told my my son this. It's like, you know, he was he was a big soccer player. And I was like, you don't have to be the fastest. You don't have to be the strongest. You don't have to score the mo- most goal. But you can outwork, out hustle, outlast. That's really the key. Yeah, I, you know, honestly, and the beauty in professional wrestling is that, and I think everybody in wrestling uh, has those moments of insecurity where you're not sure if anything's going to work. But it's that feeling when something you did goes out in front of the fans and regardless of all the anxiety you had about it going leading up to it, the moment they react, it's always worth it. Yeah. So good. Jen, I want to thank you for being here on AEW Unrestricted. This has been a wonderful interview. It's g- given us such wonderful insights. You can, of course, check out new episodes of AEW Unrestricted every Thursday on your favorite podcast platforms. We've got video episodes available every Monday on our YouTube channel if you want to see our beautiful mugs. <laughs> if you want to see the work that Miss Jen Pepperman does, you can check out AEW Dynamite every Wednesday 8 p.m. TBS. We've got AEW Rampage every Friday on TNT. AEW Collision every Saturday on TNT. And watch new episodes of Ring of Honor every Thursday on Honor Club. Watch ROH.com. This has been AEW Unrestricted. I'm Will Washington. She's Aubrey Edwards. We'll see you next time. Have a great night. Peace. Thank you, guys. Come on, throw your hands up. Let me see you. Unrestricted. Got the house now. We gonna turn it.